typewritten note lies next to a dead man. A document examiner must read between the lines to lead authorities to the killer. A murderer writes, then destroys, the story of his crime. Investigators will do everything to assure the tale ends with a conviction. And a to-do list scrawled on an ordinary piece of cardboard includes an extraordinary task. Detectives look to handwriting to prove a murder was premeditated. Among today's new detectives are the forensic document examiners. Under their keen eye, a scrap of paper or a typewriter ribbon can be as incriminating as a confession signed in blood. Minnesota, February 6, 1995. Police officers responded to a 911 call. They arrived at the home of Ted Mills, his wife, Mamie Hernandez Mills, and stepson, Nathan Latou. Mamie and Nathan had come home from a dental appointment to find Ted Mills dead and the house ransacked. Mills lay with a shotgun wound in his head. The back door of the house showed signs of forced entry. The strewn clothing seemed to indicate a robbery had taken place. Three twenty eight dispatcher. Supervisor respond. Then police found a note. If somebody's been through this dresser. Typed on a torn sheet of lined yellow note paper, it read, this is for our bud that you sent to jail. Rest in peace. It was one clue that would speak volumes, not just in the words on the page, but in its paper and ink. Sergeant David Palmer of the Minneapolis Homicide Unit relied on the expertise of forensic document examiner Karen Runyon to help him read between the lines. Document examiners match writers with their penmanship, typists with their typewriters, counterfeiters with their forgeries. Using computers, microscopes, and digital enhancement, these new detectives delve into the minuscule world of paper fibers and carbon particles to solve crimes. As the document examiner in this case, it was up to Runyon to learn all she could from the slip of paper. The note was collected by the crime scene people and brought to me. And I first made an examination to determine how the note had been prepared. And it had been prepared with a typewriter that used a carbon film ribbon, which told me that if the ribbon could be located, the ribbon could be read and matched possibly to this entry. Runyon told officers to look for an electric typewriter with a carbon film ribbon, and if they found one like that, they should collect it as evidence. As well, they should be aware that this document had a fractured lower edge to it, where it's been torn off of the rest of the piece of paper, and they should look for any pieces of um, paper like this with any fractured edge or any type of tablet that this might have been torn out of. While Runyon focused on the note, 
the police questioned the victim's wife and stepson. According to Mamie and Nathan, they were at a dental appointment when the murder occurred. They phoned home from the dentist's office, but no one answered. Ted should have been home, but they assumed he was sound asleep, since he worked nights and slept days. The note suggested the murder and burglary were a payback for a past burglary at their home that was foiled by the victim. Mills had helped send the burglar to jail. Sergeant Palmer initially believed the story, but the seeds of doubt were already sprouting. Well, there was some uh, truth to this, and we couldn't discount this. But at the same time, our experience tells us that generally burglars are not going to return or have somebody return and kill somebody because of an identification that they have made. During questioning, which police videotaped, Nathan Latou told police he saw a handgun next to Mills' body, but police couldn't find it. They were skeptical. Certain details didn't match Latou's story. They have two dogs in the house that bark whenever strangers come, and yet Ted Mills is sleeping upstairs and never woke up. To Palmer, that suggested the culprit wasn't a stranger. But Mamie and Nathan's alibis had support. A caller ID unit at the house registered their call from the dentist's office around the time of the murder. Another detail nagged at Palmer. The place seemed ransacked in too orderly a manner, not the way a burglar would generally tear up a room. We were suspicious about this because our experience as investigators, most burglars are not this neat as we found contents pulled out so they could be put readily and easily back into the drawers that they were dumped. And Latou's 911 call to police raised further suspicion. Yes, my father's been shot. What happened? We just got home. I was at the VA hospital with my mom. They broke in the back door. Trashed upstairs, they shot him. He just had too much knowledge that he was able to tell us immediately. Most people, when you talk to them in a, in they're in a hysterical state like this, they can't hardly tell you what time of the day it is. All they can do is screaming and crying and, and get somebody out there to help us. But this was, this was a different thing. We had an uneasy feeling about this. Something about the case didn't ring true. The pieces just didn't fit. The strongest indication that all was not as it seemed was a fingerprint on a broken window at the point of entry. It belonged to Nathan Latou. When Nathan Latou was confronted with the fingerprint evidence, he broke down and admitted his involvement in the murder. Days before the killing, Latou said his mother asked him to write out, in longhand, the phrases typed on the note found next to Mills. Now, investigators had reason to believe that Mamie Hernandez Mills typed the note herself. But how? She said she couldn't read or write English, and there was no typewriter in the house. Police needed to find the typewriter used to create the note. Now that Nathan had implicated Mamie, Runyon and investigators began to focus their search. They remembered that Hernandez Mills cleaned houses for a living. Police decided to look for a typewriter in the last few homes she worked in. In one of them, police found an electric typewriter with a carbon film ribbon. The last few words of the note were clearly visible. They also found several yellow notepads with paper similar to the note. The ribbon was brought to Karen Runyon's lab for analysis. 
she was relieved to find the film cartridge had been left in the typewriter. If the ribbon had been used up and discarded, the case would have become even more complicated. To confirm the ribbon contained the full text of the note, she carefully pried open the cartridge. I took the ribbon cartridge apart, and then I transcribed the ribbon itself, working from the final entry, which we could see on the ribbon as we took it out of the typewriter. I worked backwards from there, transcribing everything that was typed on that ribbon. Runyon discovered the note had been typed three times. It proved that whoever typed it knew little about how to use the typewriter. The first two times it was typed, there were spelling errors, and the typist must not have realized that there was a correcting device on the machine. And so they must have started over. Runyon compared fibers that had been transferred from the paper onto the ribbon. When the carbon is knocked off the ribbon onto the document, paper fibers adhere to that mylar strip that the carbon is on in the ribbon cartridge, and the paper fibers stay on the ribbon itself. By matching the fibers adhering to the ribbon with the fibers on the note, Runyon concluded that the note was indeed typed using this ribbon. You match the fibers almost like a fingerprint. The fibers are in a random pattern, and they've adhered to this ribbon in that same random pattern that they were on the paper itself. With Karen Runyon's help, the sordid story inside the plastic casing began to unravel. Within the typewriter ribbon cassette lay the true story of what happened to Ted Mills. The clues were microscopic, but their significance was great. In this case, I was able to match all the fibers in each of the letters on this note. Karen Runyon had linked the note to the typewriter, and police linked the typewriter to Mamie Hernandez Mills. But the full story still needed to be told. Sergeant Palmer had to determine Mamie's role in the crime and a motive for committing it. He continued to coax more details from Nathan Latou. He said that his mother uh, had uh, got the shotgun that belonged to her husband up from the closet upstairs and had gone over and had shot her husband while he was laying in the bed, sleeping. He, in fact, said that he went and got the shotgun that was used in the murder, took it down and concealed it in a room downstairs in the basement that was next to where he slept. Nathan eventually tells myself and my partner, Sergeant Krebs, what we wanted to know, that he and his mother were responsible for the death of Ted Mills. Nathan Latou swore, however, that he didn't pull the trigger. By the same token, as he implicated his mother, he was also gravely concerned about her fate. He's very uh, worried about what's going to happen to his mother. More so than himself, he's very worried and very protective of his mother throughout this whole thing. Is he keeps admonishing us not to hurt his mother, not to do anything to his mother. Mamie Hernandez Mills maintained her cool and her innocence. When she's talking to us, she's very cooperative with us. I mean, she gives you the appearance to ask me anything, I'll tell you anything. But obviously, except for that one thing, she will never, even in this interview, admit that she had anything to do with the death of Ted Mills. As the pressure of the interrogation began to build, Mamie turned against her son, just as Nathan had turned against her. She told police Nathan had raped her at gunpoint. Hearing this lie, Nathan Latou broke down again. He had been withholding his greatest secret of all. He and his mother had been having an incestuous relationship. 41-year-old Mamie Hernandez Mills had only recently reunited with 22-year-old Nathan Latou, whom she gave up for adoption years earlier. Now, Mamie was exerting a profound influence on her son. The police used that influence as leverage to obtain a confession from Latou. We're kind of using, we're saying, Mamie, your mother kind of pushed you to doing this, because she's the very strong, controlling 
person in this relationship that they have. Mother is controlling son. Finally, Latou agreed to testify against his mother in return for a reduced charge of second-degree murder. At about the same time, investigators discovered that Mills had a life insurance policy through work and that Mamie had called to claim it shortly after his death. With this motive now exposed, the shuffled events of that bloody February day fell into place. Mamie Hernandez Mills had typed the note on her employer's typewriter, using Nathan's handwritten note as her guide. Each time she made a mistake, she started over, leaving behind a telltale story inside the typewriter cartridge. Each keystroke pulled fibers from the paper, transferring them to the mylar strip on the ribbon. Nathan Latou faked a break-in at their home. He made it look just as a burglar had months before, but he left behind an incriminating fingerprint. As Nathan and Mamie climbed the stairs, they were careful not to wake Ted Mills. Upon entering the bedroom, they wasted no time. After killing Mills, the two faked the burglary. Mamie left a note meant to steer investigators toward an avenging intruder who never existed. Then, mother and son went to the hospital to keep a dental appointment. Um, can we use your phone, please? While there, they used a phone to check in at home knowing their call would be registered by the caller ID unit. This call was the basis for their alibi. When they arrived back home, Nathan placed the 911 call to police. He later told investigators he'd hidden the murder weapon in a pipe and buried it beneath a tree. In court, he testified against his mother in exchange for a reduced sentence. Mamie Hernandez Mills was convicted of first-degree murder on April 20th, 1996. She is serving a life sentence. Nathan Latou pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 24 years. By leaving a note, Mamie Hernandez Mills and Nathan Latou meant to cast blame on a fictional intruder, but they left too much real-world evidence to the contrary. The note was left next to the body and that the note was part of a scheme to make this look like another type of crime than what it really was. And in that perspective, this was an interesting case and the fact that we did find the machine with the ribbon for investigators Palmer and Runyon, a note meant to throw authorities off track led them right to the killer. In Virginia, a murder case was even more ironic. In a scrawled note to himself, a man made his deadly intentions terribly clear. The shooting death of an elderly woman in February 1995 brought police to a home in eastern Virginia. The only thing missing from the scene was $5 taken from the woman's purse. Police knew the crime was committed by 18-year-old Richard Webb, live-in grandson of the victim. According to police, Richard planned to kill his grandparents, steal their money, and take their van. The grandfather escaped when the gun malfunctioned. Unable to find keys to the van, Richard Webb fled on foot and was apprehended a short time later. Webb was guilty, but his guilt was a matter of degree. If police were right and Richard planned the killing with intent to rob, 
he'd be guilty of first-degree murder. But if he killed on a sudden, violent impulse, he'd probably receive a lesser charge. It was up to the police to determine the killer's intentions. While searching Richard's bedroom, police found an important clue in a torn piece of cardboard. On it was written a to-do list. Among such mundane items as play pool and watch movie was item number eight. It stated simply, kill. After that was get money and leave. The list seemed strong evidence that Webb had planned his crimes. It was turned over to Michael Moore, document examiner at Virginia's Division of Forensic Science in Richmond. In order to prove that Webb wrote the note, he'd need to look for similarities between the handwriting on the note and samples known to have been written by Webb. The handwriting identification is, is based on the premise uh, that handwriting embodies uh, certain qualities and features which are sufficiently personal uh, to serve as the basis for an identification of the writer. Webb's murderous list, now classified as evidence, was securely sealed and delivered to Michael Moore. Our handwriting is as personal as our fingerprints. As youngsters, most of us were taught to write by imitating a standard system, often referred to as a copybook system. In spite of this standardized technique, we begin to develop our own personal handwriting that stays with us for life. These deviations provide the basis for analysis. When examining a document, Moore looks at speed, skill, slant and height ratio, proportion, and the overall appearance of the writing. Similarities as well as differences are scrutinized. Consistent combinations of features are what Moore seeks to identify. Does it exhibit good line quality? Uh, are there some unusual stopping and starting places? Does it have uh, patching or retouching? Are there blunt beginning and ending strokes? He set to work applying a three-step process to the handwriting examination. He knew from the start this was to be a challenging assignment. In the first phase, he was concerned strictly with the writing surface. Moore noted that something had been torn from the face of the smooth cardboard, exposing rough inner layers. Any handwriting on these layers might be distorted by the rough surface portions of this particular piece of cardboard being so rough uh, were difficult to write on and there was some overwriting um, you know meaning that the person that did the writing had to actually write over several times in order to to get a visible image glue adhering to the cardboard interfered with the movement of the pen moore had to factor that into his analysis some of the uh, uh, unusual or blunt, uh, awkward movements, for example, where the, where the ink or the pen came into contact um, with the foreign matter, with the adhesive. Is this the habit of the writer to square off this particular portion of this letter, or is this as a result of coming in contact with this amount of glue? The first phase of the examination showed that the rough edges, as well as the glue, may have affected the shape of the letters. In item number two, the bottom of the W in work is squared off where the pen hit the glue. If the writing sample contains letters with closed loops, the document examiner must determine whether they are the habit of the person who wrote the sample or if they were created by the water-based ink bleeding and closing the loop. These variations in the writing surface can cause the letters to deviate from the author's normal handwriting, making it difficult to analyze.
In the second phase of examination, Moore studied the known material or handwriting known to have come from the suspect. Again, he faced a challenge. In custody, Webb was asked to fill out forms, take dictation on a piece of cardboard, and produce other writing to compare with the original list. Watch movie. Go to town. Moore made the comparison, but he found the samples inadequate. Webb penned the dictated writings in a very formal, controlled environment. Kill. The original list was undoubtedly written under very different conditions. The two sets of writing only vaguely resembled each other. Moore was able to say he had some reason to believe that Webb had written the list, but he couldn't be absolutely certain. To make a more conclusive judgment, he needed to see more of Webb's writings. No two writings from any one person, even if they were done by the same person, will ever be exactly alike, meaning that they'll superimpose. It can't happen. People are not machines. He asked the detective for additional writings from Webb, because factors such as body position and writing surfaces affect handwriting, he requested the samples come from a variety of circumstances. I wanted to talk to you. The type of medium that was written on, uh, you know, one would expect that it was probably not done at a table or at a desk. It, it could have been standing up. It, uh, unsupported, and it could have been holding a piece of cardboard in his hand. Just no way to know. The sheriff's deputies gathered an assortment of Webb's writing, including personal letters, cards, and some of his poetry. Webb had written these samples over a period of time, so they showed a wider range of his handwriting styles. Now came Moore's biggest challenge, the final phase of the handwriting examination where he'd make the critical side-by-side -side comparison of the list and Webb's previously written material. For presentation in court, he used a black and white enlargement of the list. The features and characteristics used to identify handwriting take many forms. Some are conspicuous, some are subtle. On the cardboard list, Moore noted that the relative size of numerals to capital letters was consistent. The number one was taller than the capital C in call. The number two was also taller than the capital W in work. Moore found this same habit reflected in the known writings of Richard Webb. The significance of Webb's natural range of variation raised a problem for Moore. He had to account for Webb's tendency to form the letter R slightly differently each time he wrote it. In item number one, the letter began well to the left of the spine, then continued on to form a rounded upper portion. In item nine, that capital R still began to the left of the spine, but the top portion was flat. Moore recognized the same variations of the letter R on Webb's known writings. They matched exactly the variations found on the cardboard list. The combination of these features led Moore to a single conclusion. He could state with virtual certainty that Richard Webb was the person who wrote the list on the cardboard and had therefore premeditated his crimes. Ultimately, it takes a human mind to recognize a human hand. While computers are helping to solve more crimes every day, Michael Moore feels his job is secure. While computers are, are useful in some areas of, of forensic document examination, they really just are not applicable to comparative handwriting uh, by the mere fact that they have no way of, of, first of all, gauging the relative individuality of the question signature. Even if 20 variations of a signature were scanned into a computer, it might still fail to identify a 21st signature as coming from that same writer. Computers do not have the ability to judge the range of variation or the circumstances under which the writing was produced. 
computers are just not not in today's what's available in today's market are just not not capable of, of doing what what the human can do when confronted with Moore's findings Richard Webb pleaded guilty and received a life sentence for capital murder ultimately handwriting analysis matched the killer to his crime but when comparing handwriting the analyst must always be certain he's focusing on the right clues the most crucial writing samples may come from the least likely sources. One handwriting expert's small lapse in judgment fueled the flames of one of the greatest hoaxes in modern history. In April 1983, the world was riveted by the news that Adolf Hitler's diaries had been discovered in Stuttgart. The 60 handwritten volumes written over 35 years, were found by a German journalist. To determine if the books were truly written in Hitler's hand, the German government enlisted a brigade of specialists, including handwriting analyst Ordway Hilton. Hilton was given seven samples of Hitler's writing to compare to the diaries. Based on these samples, he declared the diaries authentic. It was an honest mistake that almost destroyed his reputation. Hilton was duped. He correctly determined that the author of the diaries also wrote the samples he used to compare them with. But his fatal flaw was his assumption that Hitler wrote the samples. He didn't. They were written by the same person who forged the diaries. That man was Conrad Cougeot. The diaries were sold for more than two million dollars before the fraud was exposed by an international team of document examiners, chemists, and historians. By studying the composition of the paper, the quality of the type, and other characteristics, they determined the diaries were no more than four years old. When the West German State Archives announced their findings, they discredited the books in no uncertain terms declaring the diaries the grotesquely superficial concoction of a copyist endowed with a limited intellectual capacity. Even so, Cougeot perpetrated the most expensive fraud in the history of publishing. If it weren't for the expertise of forensic examiners, he might have pulled it off. But incriminating documents seem to have a way of ending up in the right hands, especially if the crime is murder. In Smyrna, Tennessee, outside of Nashville, a man made a poignant televised appeal for help in 1994. Ricky Bryan, a 39-year-old welder, had a sporadic five-year relationship with 72-year-old Charlotte Scott. I did date the woman for a little over six years. And she's missing, so we gotta find her. Scott had been missing for two weeks. I wish she'd come back home, wherever she's at. The family was hopeful she would be found. I have to pray that something, someone comes forward. Scott's daughter Rosalie reported her missing after finding her gone and her apartment door left open. We just would like to know where, where she is. Police anybody home? Police searched Scott's home on October 19th. She was last seen filling a prescription and going to a money machine. Her car was parked outside her apartment. Back door is still open. You want to check upstairs? There were no indications of forced entry. All the signs of a daily routine were still intact, as if she would be returning shortly. With no clues to be found in the house, police turned to Ricky Bryan. They hoped he could provide some information. At first, it didn't seem Bryan could help them. 
He said he was out of town when Scott disappeared and claimed they hadn't spoken in three months. But Brian helped police more than he imagined. Detectives E.J. Bernard of the Metro Nashville Police and Clayton Thomas of the Smyrna Police found a hole in Brian's story, a hole they hoped to climb through to get to the truth. They discovered Brian had used Scott's ATM card the day she was reported missing. Detective Bernard. He told us he wasn't in Nashville, but we had proof of this through the camera, statements from his relatives, as well as the transactions from the bank, which was very close to her residence. With that proof, Brian's alibi crumbled. But just because he took Scott's money didn't mean he was involved in her disappearance. Even so, the lie made him the only suspect in this crime of few clues. After he failed a polygraph test, police obtained a warrant to search his home. They were looking for ATM receipts, weapons, tools that might be used in a kidnapping or a murder, anything that could link Brian to the crime. They found nothing. They had no physical evidence and no more leads. The investigation ground to a halt. A few frustrating days passed before detectives received a break. Some of Brian's family members stepped forward. They told police he had divulged an outrageous story. According to Ricky Bryan, Charlotte Scott was murdered by a gang of drunken men at a rock quarry where the couple frequently met. Ricky had left for a few minutes, and when he returned, Charlotte had been killed. He knew the story sounded absurd and he had no witnesses to prove he wasn't involved. So he decided to bury the body and deny he knew what happened to her. In one respect, police agreed with him. The story was absurd. But why would he concoct such a tale unless he really did bury Charlotte Scott? If the strange tale was his way of deflecting guilt from himself, it had the opposite effect. Police now had reason to suspect Charlotte Scott was murdered and that Ricky Bryan killed her, but they still had not a shred of evidence. When police confronted him about the story, he denied he ever told it. Even so, the story was the only lead they had. They began searching for the buried body. Despite their long hours and the use of cadaver dogs, they turned up nothing. Then, Michael Thompson, Ricky Bryan's nephew, approached Detective Thomas and offered his help. The 19-year-old would soon lead investigators to a spot in the woods and Ricky Bryan to a point of no return. Investigators rely on skill, wit, and luck to find breaks in criminal cases. In the murder investigation of Charlotte Scott, the break stepped forward in the form of Michael Thompson, nephew of Ricky Bryan. Thompson volunteered to speak with Bryan and hopefully learn the whereabouts of the victim's body. Police told Michael Thompson they'd appreciate him sharing any information he might find out. On November 15th, 1994, Thompson went to visit his uncle. Brian was extremely suspicious. He was convinced his house was bugged and that police were watching his every move. After searching his nephew for a listening device, Brian and Thompson engaged in a stilted dialogue meant to mask the true thrust of the conversation. Brian needed to recover a shovel and rake he buried in the woods with Scott's body. 
Here was his confession. But he wasn't about to say it out loud. Instead, he wrote it in a notebook. Each time he wrote a message, he ripped the paper from the notebook and burned it in a wood stove. He was afraid if they were found, the tools would link him to the body. And during the written communication, Brian sketched a detailed map pinpointing where the tools and the body were buried. Then he burned the map, just as he had burned the other notes. That evidence was gone. But not for long. After leaving Brian's home, Michael Thompson immediately called police. Following the directions he'd memorized from the map drawn by his uncle, he led them to a pit in the woods. There, they found a body. 327 T Sarge, uh, definitely her. 327 There was an odor of uh, decomposed flesh. We then started going through the items. There was a lot of debris. We pulled debris out. And at one point, Detective Thomas found the, uh, the foot belonging to the victim. The remains were crushed and mutilated almost beyond recognition. With the help of an identification unit, Detectives Thomas and Bernard recovered and identified the body of Charlotte Scott. Nearly a month had passed since she had last been seen. The case had stalled for several weeks as investigators tried in vain to trip up Ricky Bryan. But now they could go forward. Charlotte Scott had been found. And Ricky Bryan's weird story about burying her body had led to her discovery. Police had what they needed to arrest Ricky Bryan, but not enough to convict him. They needed hard evidence that proved Bryan knew where the body was buried. The testimony of his nephew may not have been enough to convince a jury. They needed the notebook in which he drew the map. The map itself was unrecoverable, but if the notebook could be found, perhaps the remaining pages would bear its faint impression proving Brian had total knowledge of the slaying. Once again, Brian's family helped police by bringing Detective Thomas the clue he sought. In December, the brother of Ricky Bryan was cleaning up the house uh, that Ricky Bryan resided in and came across a notebook. The notebook was then immediately brought to me. Uh, upon looking at the notebook, I could see impressions of where something had been written on. The vague impressions defied all efforts to read them. But Thomas was convinced they could be turned into hard evidence if only they could be made legible. For that, he depended on the forensic laboratory of the U.S. Postal Service in Memphis, Tennessee. Examining more than 17,000 documents each year, it's one of the busiest document evaluation centers in the United States. The lab is equipped to analyze anything having to do with ink and paper. They can regain writing that's been erased and even illuminate signatures that have been scribbled out. An infrared light source called a crime scope makes some inks invisible and others fluoresce, disclosing hidden writing. The lab usually examines documents relating to white collar crimes, credit card thefts, forgeries and fraud. It occasionally assists with outside criminal investigations, especially in cases of murder. Forensic document analyst Grant Sperry has been with the lab for 18 years. Postal Service normally does not get involved in local police cases. Our primary responsibility is to assist or support postal inspectors in the investigation of their offenses by providing them with forensic expertise in the area of fingerprints or document examination. However, uh, in certain cases, uh, such as this one, where a heinous crime has been committed, well, we will offer our assistance. 
have here is a, uh, a notebook. In November of 1994, oh, Detective Thomas brought forensic document analyst Grant Sperry the notebook from Ricky Bryan's house. The original map was... Uh, if these seemingly blank pages could be coaxed into revealing their secrets, Thomas would have the evidence he needed to convict a killer. We can conduct. He would depend on Sperry and the postal laboratory to decipher the faint impressions of writing left on the page. These telltale furrows are called indented writing. They're embossed on a blank page when the page above is written on. Would the ghostly impressions in the notebook tell the story of Charlotte Scott's murder? Would they be enough to convict Ricky Bryan? Okay, Patricia, we need to uh, photograph. Using a fiber optic light source to illuminate the surface of the paper, Sperry determined that Brian's notebook did indeed contain faint impressions of the map and other indented writings. After photographing it, he utilized the electrostatic detection apparatus, or ESDA. The ESDA would make the ghost-like indentations visible. The beauty of the ESDA is that it's non-destructive for the most part. In other words, your document is protected by the uh, film, the imaging film, you can retain a permanent record of any of your indentations that are developed. Sperry placed the page from the notebook on a brass plate and pulled plastic film over it. Then a vacuum drew the film into the paper fibers and into the impressions. The film was then electrically charged while toner cascaded over it. The toner was attracted by the charge and filled the indentations in the film. Once the toner settled into place, Sperry secured it with a sheet of adhesive-backed plastic. Next step is to press, take the clear plastic adhesive, which now has an image on it developed with our ESDA. and cut this image down to size, removing the excess plastic. Before lifting the plastic film, Sperry smoothed it to remove air bubbles. It's not uncommon. A single document might go through the ESDA process five to 10 times to bring out every nuance. See here we have uh, entries that appear to be school uh, inside of a- If necessary, the lift can be scanned into a computer to enhance and separate the image. In this case, the lift of the map was so bold that Sperry could read the indented writings with a magnifying glass. Thomas and Sperry were pleased with the quality of the lift and with the number of writing samples that emerged. ESDA disclosed every detail of the carefully drawn map, leading no doubt as to where it led. An arrow drawn to this little circled area, does that mean anything? Yes. This is going to be Industrial Boulevard. The roadway will be a, uh, the pit. The pit? That the body was located it in. It was, okay. Additionally, you have the words shovel and rake alongside yes. that. Yes. On his map, Brian used specific and, uh, detail to describe the where he buried his victim. His this I was the evidence detectives were looking for. Once he had a clear image of the map, Sperry compared the writing to known samples of Ricky Bryan's writing. Well, in this particular case, not only was it important to have the uh, details of the map, as they ultimately were revealed through this examination, but because we had writing available to examine, uh, obviously since the details of this map are precisely and, and pinpoint precisely where the body was located, the author of the map uh, one would think would have absolute knowledge of where that body was. So it became important to determine exactly who did, in fact, write it. More for the writing samples on the map matched known samples of Ricky Bryan's handwriting. Sperry had proved that Ricky Bryan was the author of the map. Once all the evidence was revealed, 
Detective Bernard pieced together a likely scenario of Brian's crime. He went to her house late one night, took her from the house, brought her to this isolated area here, killed her, mutilated her, and then buried her in a grave. What led Ricky Bryan to brutally murder the woman he claimed to love? Some said it was for her money. Clayton Thomas feels differently. I think he was really in love with her. Uh, I feel that, uh, uh, that during this time, uh, she was uh, breaking off the relationship. And I felt that if he couldn't have her, no one else could have her as well. Ricky Bryan never admitted killing Charlotte Scott. To the end, he clung to his story about the mysterious gang of men. He was charged with first degree murder and sentenced to 25 years before he'd be eligible for parole. When a killer leaves behind a paper trail, little does he know that he may have already signed his confession. Every document tells two stories. One is intended by the writer, and anyone can read it. But the other is a secret tale that sometimes hides a terrible truth. Document examiners are the tellers of these tales, who seek the indelible truth behind the paper and ink. On a stormy Halloween night, a passenger plane begins a routine landing. But what happens is far from routine. Investigators must determine what terrible chain of events brought it down nose first, killing everyone aboard. In the fog, a Canadian commuter plane aborts a landing maneuver. Seconds later, it plows full speed into the woods nearby. Was the accident caused by mechanical failure or a fatal lapse of judgment? The answers are preserved in the indestructible black box. Dutifully recording a plane's final maneuvers and the crew's last words, black boxes help investigators make sense of the fields of destruction. After a crash, a black box is often the only surviving witness to terror. On the evening of October 31st, 1994, American Eagle Flight 4184 took off in the rain from Indianapolis to Chicago, less than 200 miles away. As the twin-engine turboprop approached its destination, air traffic controllers told the crew to expect delays. A fierce storm was backing up traffic outside O'Hare International Airport. The plane was put in a holding pattern over a rural section of northeast Indiana. The pilots noticed some icing and activated equipment to crack it off the wings. They depended on the autopilot to keep the plane steady and to maintain altitude. Attendants tried to reassure passengers that they would make their connections. All the other flights were delayed too. One of the busiest airports in the world was at a total standstill. In an announcement reconstructed from transcripts, the captain tried to reassure the restless passengers. Well, folks, uh, once again, this is the captain. I do regret to inform you that uh, air traffic control is saying at this point another 13 minutes. Um, we'll be sure to keep you updated. I do apologize. The plane had been holding for more than 30 minutes. Because of the storm, some passengers had debated whether to board the flight. Now they grew increasingly anxious. Finally, the transcripts indicated that controllers cleared flight 4184 to begin landing procedures. Two flight 184, descent, descend and maintain 8,000. Uh, and then 8,000, Eagle flight 184. Eagle flight 184, uh, should be about 10 minutes until uh, you're cleared in. Uh, thank you. It was the last communication.
communication Flight 4184 would have with controllers. As the plane began its descent, something went terribly wrong. Instead of leveling off at 8,000 feet, the plane continued to descend, picking up speed. It plummeted through 7,000 feet, 6,000 feet, 5,000 feet. At 4,000 feet, it vanished from the radar screen. The aircraft plunged into a muddy soybean field in rural Indiana, shattering on impact. Fighting driving rain and freezing temperatures, rescue workers searched through the night for any sign of life from the 72 passengers and crew. Finally, they faced the truth. No one survived. When an airplane crashes in the United States, it's up to the National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB, to determine what went wrong. Greg Fife was the lead investigator in the case of Flight 4184. When I go out to an accident site, I'm playing Dick Tracy. My job is to go out and find all the evidence, all the clues that tell us what happened. The public demands answers and looks to the NTSB to provide them, fast. So agents are brought in quickly. They are often among the first to witness the devastation. It can be very overwhelming. I mean, it's an emotional thing, because when you're walking through all of this wreckage, you're seeing pictures, you're seeing teddy bears, you're seeing clothing of children and things like that. So you can't help but start to become emotionally attached but as an investigator, in order for me to remain objective, you have to separate your emotion out of that and you gotta block it out so that you can do your job and do it effectively. And that's not always easy for us. As the sun rose the next morning, it revealed the true horror of the accident. Impact craters marred the once peaceful farm, transforming it to a field of death. The narrow country roads of Roselawn, Indiana bustled with truckloads of rescue equipment and the clamor of news crews. A team of forensic aviation experts from the NTSB arrived. Their job was to create order from the growing chaos so they could focus on the difficult task of figuring out what happened. Immediately what our investigator and the team will do is actually what we call document the four corners. We want to look for all of the wreckage. We want to make sure that both wings are there, the tail section is there, the engines are there. But the investigation was hampered by health risks. Fuel covered everything. The site was declared a biohazard. Only those in safety gear went in and out. Rescue workers and investigators teamed up to flag evidence and remains. They worked side by side, examining every piece. As soon as possible, Parts of bodies were transported to the morgue to begin the difficult identification process. For us, the investigators, we're looking at physical evidence of the airplane, that is, the wreckage itself. For the coroner, who has to go out there and, and look for the bodies or the victims, um, they had a, as tough a time as we did because they didn't have whole people. They had fragments of people. And so for both of us to do our job, we had to work hand in hand because if I found a piece of wreckage, there may have been critical evidence for the coroner in, in uh, a piece of uh, a victim. And so we worked hand in hand when we were looking at all of this wreckage so that I could help him collect whatever evidence he needed to identify the people that were on that airplane. As bodies were identified, they were released for burial. Family members found solace in each other and in the chaplains and counselors who volunteered to help. But in the midst of family sorrow, investigators kept working. They scoured the soybean field for answers. To figure out how the plane broke up, they viewed the wreckage from above. They examined the scars in the earth created by the impact, and the locations of the scattered pieces of airplane. The patterns can tell them if a piece broke off on impact or if it fell off during flight, causing the accident. What they found in the ruins of Flight 4184 was startling. 
typically when you have an airplane that's either come straight down or made an emergency type landing, you'll find the initial impact point and then wreckage in a V-tail or fan-shaped pattern. With this particular accident site, we had a, a very high speed, high angle of attack uh, impact into the ground. So we had a, a main impact crater, but we found the tail section in a very oddball place in relation to the main impact crater. That led to the team to think, hmm, how did that get there? And it was an evident that it was an in-flight breakup, so the tail had come off before the airplane hit the ground. Now, investigators had a possible explanation. A structural failure may have caused the tail to break off in flight. But airplane tails don't just break off. Something must have triggered the failure. More evidence needed to be examined. More data gathered. The weather that night provided the first clue. The conditions were ideal for icing. To many, the freezing rain in which the plane was flying could have been a major factor. But it seemed unlikely that icing on the wings could cause the tail to fracture. The only way to determine what really happened would be to look inside the plane's black box. A black box is actually two boxes. And they're not black, they're orange, making them easier to find. One contains a record of the plane's mechanical workings. It's called the flight data recorder. The other is the cockpit voice recorder. Basically a crash-proof tape recorder, it contains an account of everything the pilots say. It also picks up alarms, engine noise, and perhaps the horrifying sound of impact. Within hours, the boxes were whisked away to NTSB headquarters in Washington, D.C. There, technicians prepared them for analysis. Sometimes black boxes provide instant answers. Other times, they only deepen the mystery. As investigators prepared the playback equipment, they also prepared themselves. They'd be the first to hear what the pilots said as they faced death head on. After maintaining a holding pattern near O'Hare Airport, Flight 4184 was cleared to descend from 10,000 feet. Seconds later, the plane crashed into the earth, killing everyone aboard. Now, investigators would listen to the cockpit voice recorder as the plane began its fatal plunge. The crew's words during the terrifying last moments are taken from transcripts. chilling tape made it clear the pilots were completely broadsided. They didn't know they were in trouble until it was too late. But it raised more questions than it answered. Investigators were no closer to learning what happened. Their last hope lay inside the second box, the Flight Data Recorder, or FDR. Now all the plane's mechanical functions or malfunctions would be analyzed. Doug Brazy is a black box expert at NTSB. He's responsible for turning the complicated bits of data from FDRs into useful information. The data recorded by an FDR depends on the age and type of plane it's in. The one on flight 4184 monitored about 100 mechanical functions. Brazy downloaded the information to a computer using tape decks that translate the coded data. The information appears as charts and graphs on the computer. They represent the pilot's actions and the airplane's performance in the final minutes before it plunged to Earth. The readouts were placed side by side on a timeline to see their relationships. As the data appeared, Brazy discovered the plane had experienced an abrupt, catastrophic event. To get a better understanding, he created an animated version of the plane's last moments. 
It's very difficult to get a sense of time and how quickly or slowly things can unfold from looking at numbers and graphs. The animation helps us see how quickly or how slowly things develop in the accident sequence. The animation combines all the plane's functions just before it fell into a visual model that investigators can study. It began as the plane started its descent from 10,000 feet. Without warning, the autopilot disengaged. The ailerons, flaps on the wings that control flight, suddenly flipped. The plane rolled violently to the right. The pilots grabbed the controls and struggled to level out. But the speed of the roll was too great. It yanked the controls out of their hands and the nose dived toward Earth. As they burst through the clouds, the ground filled their windshield, rushing toward them at 400 miles per hour. Futilely, the pilots pulled back on the controls to bring up the nose. The resulting strain on the tail was too great. It snapped off just before the plane hit the ground. The animation made the sequence of events tragically clear. The airplane was in flight. When the airplane rolled, it initially rolled to approximately 77 degrees the first time, and the nose started to pitch down. The first officer was able to recover it slightly, and as he tried to pull the nose back up, the airplane then rolled again completely through 360 degrees, the nose pitched down, and the roll continued another approximately 140 degrees until the first officer was able to get the, the roll stopped. But because of the very steep attitude that the airplane was in, and as he tried to pull out, he had a lot of aerodynamic force on the tail section of the airplane because he was pulling extreme. He was actually moving these flight control surfaces to their maximum. High aerodynamic loads, this part of the airplane literally came off, and the airplane then basically went over on its nose, striking the ground and then fragmenting and as it fragmented, this part of the aircraft ended up getting slingshotted to the furthest point in the wreckage area. It was now evident that the crash wasn't caused by the tail breaking off in flight. That left icing as the probable cause. But Brazy knew icing would normally show up on the screen as a slow, steady buildup, not a sudden cataclysm. What could have overpowered the plane so quickly and sent it careening to Earth? Knowing what makes a plane fly can provide clues to how it can fall. At Embry-Riddle University in Prescott, Arizona, wind tunnels are used to demonstrate the aerodynamics of flight. Here, the invisible forces of wind are made to glow, unveiling the basic principle of flight. The faster that air moves over a surface, the less pressure it exerts. The slower moving air underneath pushes upward, causing the surface to lift. Aerospace engineer Richard Felton demonstrates the principle with a simple experiment. Let me uh, demonstrate with a sheet of paper, if I might. Uh, I'm going to blow over the top of this surface of paper, so I'm not going to create anything below. There's no magic here at all, okay? And as you can see, the paper actually raises. Wings are not flat like paper, but they work the same way. The air moves faster across the round top of the wing because it has more surface to cover. But it's critical that the top surface be smooth and that nothing on it disrupts the flow of air. If the airflow is disturbed, the object loses the pressure that lifts it. Any foreign objects on the wings can disrupt the airflow. For instance, ice can build up, then break off, leaving jagged edges. That may produce enough turbulence to bring down a plane. Flight 4184 was an ATR-72 series airplane. Rose Lawn investigators discovered that these planes had a history of icing problems. But the FDR showed that its de-icing system was working properly, and the readout didn't show normal icing patterns. Then, investigators learned of a weather phenomenon called supercooled drizzle drops, 
extra-large freezing rain. A check with meteorologists told them the conditions that stormy Halloween night were right for this phenomenon to occur. Was weather the fatal factor? To find out, the manufacturer of the ATR took to the skies over the Mojave Desert in California. There, they tried to recreate the exact conditions of the storm. In an experiment called a tanker test, a modified U.S. Air Force jet produced an icing cloud eight feet wide. An ATR, like the one at Roselawn, flew into the cloud. The freezing rain clouds were infused with yellow dye, so investigators could see the ice forming on the nose and wings. To make sure the tragedy was not repeated, test pilots flew very high for added recovery time and were prepared to eject if necessary. At first, normal freezing rain was released. The small water droplets froze the instant they hit the front of the wings, but the de-icing boots cracked the ice off. Then, a cloud of supercooled drizzle drops was released. When the drops hit the wings, they didn't freeze instantly. Instead, they spread across the wing, freezing behind and out of reach of the de-icing boots. At last, the final piece of the puzzle was put in place. Typically, when the wing has no contamination on it, these bands, or relative wind, are smooth flowing over the top and the bottom of the airfoil. But with the Rose Lawn accident, when we had the ridge of ice, which is represented by this triangle, we have now disrupted that airflow. As the airflow then reattached or came back across the very top of the wing, it got very turbulent as it came off the trailing edge, which is represented by this area right here. That turbulence was right over the top of the ailerons. And when the turbulence created a very low pressure system, this aileron started to move from a, like a neutral position up to its maximum deflection of 14 degrees in a quarter of a second. Now, investigators concluded what happened that night and why. The pilots were in the holding pattern. They were chatting. The autopilot was on. They thought everything was fine. What they didn't know was that behind the de-icing equipment, a ridge of ice was building up. As they started to descend, the ice cracked off. What remained left ragged edges on the wing, causing turbulent airflow. The turbulence created a powerful low pressure system that acted like a vacuum. It literally sucked the ailerons up, forcing the plane into a roll. Attempts to right the plane only snapped the tail. The plane then dove into the earth. Afterward, all was silent except for the driving rain. And then, silence. The crater in a soybean field in Roselawn, Indiana, is a scar that can never be healed. But by solving the accident, investigators had done all they could. After the investigation, the ATR's de-icing system was redesigned, extending farther back on the wing, and ATR pilots are now trained for icing conditions. The work of the NTSB and others on the Roselawn case helped to reduce the chances of a similar accident happening again. Every airplane crash is the result of a fatal mixture of conditions. The ingredients come from the plane, the weather, and the pilot himself. In Canada, investigators tried to reconstruct a commuter plane's recipe for disaster. The mountains of British Columbia are among the most breathtaking in North America. But for pilots flying through them, they can be treacherous. In 1989, two young pilots at Skylink Airlines were flying five commuters in a 19-seat turboprop from Vancouver to Terrace, just over 400 miles away. They'd made the trip dozens of times, and they were familiar with the dense morning fog that often drifts through this part of Western Canada. 
The morning of September 26th was the start of just another day. Shortly before Flight 70 made its final approach to the runway, a 300-foot fog bank engulfed the airport, bringing visibility to zero. The pilot expected to see the runway lights pierce the fog at any moment. Instead, he saw only gloom. As the plane swooped down for the landing, he had second thoughts and safely aborted the maneuver. But as he pulled away, treetops suddenly loomed large through the dense haze. The airplane plowed through the branches, rolled, and burst into flames. The pilots and passengers were killed on impact. Investigators from the Transportation Safety Board of Canada were assigned the horrible task of making sense of the tangled wreckage. Trees had cracked and fallen onto the fuselage. One of the wings had sheared off. The cabin was crushed. The cockpit was peeled open, exposing a snarled mass of wires, cables, and circuitry. The force had twisted and snapped off the propellers. It took days to find pieces of aircraft that hurtled into the forest. Reading the wreckage would take even longer. It's a forensic skill that requires intensive training. At Embry-Riddle University, would-be investigators gain experience by studying the remains of actual crashes reconstructed on the site. Director of Aerospace Safety, Bill Waldock, instructs his students in what to look for okay. and how to find it. Well, just like in a crime scene, what I want the students to be able to do is to identify all of the things about this scene that are significant, to be able to find all of the parts, to be able to understand how those parts got where they were and what they mean and then to be able to take that and put it into the rest of the story and literally fit all the pieces of the puzzle back together and come up with a clear picture of what happened to this aircraft and why it happened. According to Waldock, finding out what caused a crash is the first step to preventing another one. The main purpose we do investigations is to try to figure out what happened and why it happened. And once we've done that, then we can go change things uh, and, and try to improve uh, the rest of the system. Uh, it's an expensive way to learn, but uh, usually it's uh, one of the most impressive ways to learn. And we can get the point across pretty well that way. Every do. detail of the wrecks is painstakingly duplicated, right down to the flames. If a crash site is on fire, it's crucial to determine if the flames started in the air or on the ground. A plane that burns then crashes shows a different pattern than a plane that crashes then burns. A fire that ignites during flight generally burns hotter than a fire caused by impact because it's fanned by the rushing wind. According to Waldock, pre-impact fires leave a distinctive signature. One of the things that we look for in uh, considering pre-impact fire versus post-impact fire is evidence that metal was hot when it hit the ground. And right in this area of the engine compartment on the left side, you see a little bit of feathered aluminum. To get that aluminum to broom straw or feather, that metal has to be up near its melting point. And right here we see a little bit of evidence that that process has occurred. That tells us that we had a pre-impact fire in this left engine compartment. Less than 7% of fires occur on impact. But when they do, they make the investigators' work much more difficult. When rescue crews put out the flames, the force of spraying water moves parts a considerable distance. And the fire itself can destroy valuable evidence. Fire will tend to get rid of our physical evidence. We're looking for, for example, fatigue in a uh, metal structure. If the airplane caught on fire when it hit the ground, it'll tend to erase that evidence and to burn it away. And fire is one of the worst things we can do. At the crash site in Canada, 
fire was only the first of the many challenges investigators would face. Burn patterns showed that the fire was the result of the impact, not the cause of it. Lead investigator Roger Ayotte recalls the scene. The aircraft had crashed uh, some 1,500 feet away from the airport, and uh, the actual crash site itself was not particularly large. The airplane had hit the ground at, uh, at fairly high speed, and uh, the destruction was, uh, was considerable. It certainly wasn't evident when we uh, went onto the accident site what, uh, what the problem had been. Uh, when we did start examining the wreckage, we realized that uh, the aircraft, in fact, had uh, um, uh, impacted the ground uh, inverted uh, because the engine uh, positions were, were switched on the ground. Ayotte and his team reasoned the fog may have played a role, but only a minor one. The pilots were too experienced, the collision too fast and furious, the devastation too complete. In the charred rubble, investigators located the flight's black boxes still bolted to the tail. Their bright orange exteriors were camouflaged with soot. Perhaps the boxes would reveal what happened. They were flown to Transportation Safety Board headquarters in Ottawa for analysis. In the lab, black box expert Michael Poole and computer analyst Bob Hoyle were stunned by what they found. The flight data recorder should have been an electronic device that captured most of the plane's mechanical functions on magnetic tape or microchip. Instead, it was an unauthorized and antiquated model, invented in 1951. Its use had been prohibited in many countries. Rather than electronic circuitry, the box used a stylus to etch information onto a moving roll of foil. Okay, the flight data recorder on this aircraft was an old design. It was a foil type recorder, which is a metal foil, which in, uh, five parameters are inscribed on the foil. And of those five, heading, which is a key parameter, was actually not functioning. So we, in fact, only had four parameters. And in contrast with today's modern aircraft, which have five, six hundred parameters per second, obviously there's a, a very big difference here. So we had a very limited flight data recorder. The data on that recorder is also, the resolution is very poor, and it's extremely time-consuming to extract the information off of these foil-type recorders. In its time, the foil recorder was a technological advance because it could survive impact and fire. Now, its primitive workings threaten to cripple the investigation. To eke out some meaning from the foil scratchings, Hoyle scanned them into a computer. Perhaps modern technology would give its predecessor a helping hand. Hoyle was able to sharpen and focus the information from the coarse etchings enough to interpret them. The FDR showed that the plane flew an unwavering course into the trees at more than 200 miles per hour. But one mark indicated something strange, a sudden burst of speed just before the plane struck. The information was incomplete and contradictory. Why would a plane, in the midst of an aborted landing, suddenly plunge into the ground? Poole and his colleagues turned to the cockpit voice recorder for an explanation. They found only more contradictions. The pilot told the co-pilot they were going to abort the landing, go around and try again. On the tape, in the background, the engines roared to full power. That was consistent with a climb. But it wasn't consistent with the disturbing final exchange between the pilot and co-pilot. Transcripts indicate the co-pilot began to warn that the plane was losing altitude. Descending. Okay. Descending. Well, when we first listened to the voice recorder, it was quite, quite perplexing because the crew had initiated a missed approach. They were starting to do a go-around. We could hear engine power coming up. They were asking for gear up. They were asking for flaps up. They were starting to climb out, and for some reason, the airplane transitioned from a climb out to a descent and crashed very quickly. So this was quite puzzling and that was really where we started to focus. Why was this airplane, which should have been able to fly out, shouldn't have been a big problem, transitioning from an ascent to a descent 
and hitting the ground. The black boxes yielded only vague clues. They held none of the hard data Poole had come to expect from them. He relayed the bad news to fellow investigators. The gaps left by the primitive data recorder would have to be filled in manually. A team of nearly a dozen forensic aviation specialists would have to engage in hardcore, old-fashioned detective work. Fortunately, they had an arsenal of sophisticated tools to help them. The first step was to determine if the damaged engine was the cause of the crash or the result of it. For that, investigators depended on engineering services specialist John Garstang. As part of the crash site investigation, we saw that the right engine was extensively damaged and disintegrated. Uh, in order to understand this damage, whether it occurred in flight or it occurred in the ground as a result of ground impact, we had to uh, know how the aircraft broke up. That's where we used tree information together with the attitude that it hit the ground to determine the breakup sequence. Garstang specializes in coaxing clues from places investigators can't go, like the tops of the trees. He mounted a stereoscopic camera on a helicopter and shot 3D photos of the damaged trees. He used these photos to determine the angle at which the plane struck the forest. This is the crash site. Uh, the red dots are pieces of wreckage. The aircraft initially descended through the forest starting here. All the black dots are trees that have been damaged, most of which had been cut by the aircraft. He then created a model showing the path of the plane as it plowed through the trees. It showed the plane was level as it clipped the treetops. Both engines must have been in place, keeping the plane balanced. The roll didn't occur until after it hit the trees. Garstang concluded the engines were attached on impact. Now he had to see if they were working properly. Erratic moves in the final flight path of the plane might hint at an engine problem. But because the FDR didn't have the data Garstang needed, he had to devise a clever way to reconstruct the plane's movements. He made a map showing the locations of witnesses when they heard the plane. We used the location of uh, witnesses on the ground and uh, through triangulating from where they are to where they either saw the aircraft or heard it, we were able to determine that the general flight path was in an arc like this that came, approached towards the airport in this direction, and then ultimately the plane crashed over here. Witnesses determined the flight showed no sign of trouble, and they provided Garstang with other useful information. Initially, we heard that the witnesses uh, heard noises or sounds like a wowing change in pitch that made us wonder whether there was possibly an engine problem or a propeller problem. And at the crash site, uh, we were missing uh, pieces, and there's an extensive damage done to the right engine that uh, initially led us to try and focus in that area to see if that was an area of concern. Engine trouble is often the cause of small plane crashes. To see if it was behind this accident, Chief Analyst Bill Taylor dissected the battered engines. When we're doing an engine investigation and doing a teardown, uh, there are two or three things that we're looking for. First of all, we want to see whether there's been a mechanical failure in the engine. That's most uh, apparent, most obvious, and, and the easiest thing to do. The second uh, is uh, to look for evidence of the power level. That's uh, very helpful in, in, in an accident investigation to dis discover whether the engine was producing full power. It may be running, but running at low level, at idle, as you might say. Um, it's, um, it gives an indication, uh, again, of what uh, was available to the crew at that time. If the engine was at full power when it crashed, it would bear the scars of its moving parts as they struck the engine body. Deep markings indicated the engines were at high power. The large amount of dirt and debris sucked into it on impact confirmed that finding. Taylor gave the engines a clean bill of health. 
he determined the wowing sounds heard by witnesses were normal engine sounds bouncing off the uneven terrain. He'd have to look elsewhere for answers. He checked the landing gear. It too was working. It was nearly retracted at the time of the crash, consistent with the procedure for an aborted landing. So far, the plane seemed in perfect working order. No clues had surfaced. Investigators were stymied. But was it possible something was driving the pilot to land quickly and take risks? Could he have been running out of fuel? John Garstang used infrared photography to find out. What we have here on the left is a uh, conventional color photograph of the forest, and on the right is what's referred to as a near-infrared photograph. In conventional photography, fuel blends into the natural shadow. But shot with near-infrared film, the spray of fuel appears as a dark stain. The records like the weight and balance gave us a good indication of what the fuel quantity should be and we use the infrared imagery to confirm that uh, there was sufficient quantity or a large quantity of fuel present. We have the ground scar here left by the right wing and you can see a general area of discoloration where the fuel has been sprayed as well as there's been a ground fire and branches have been broken. The photographs revealed the plane arrived at the airport with fuel to spare. Another dead end for the investigators. According to all indications, Flight 70 should never have crashed. But it did. And until investigators figured out why, the tragedy could recur. The nagging question remained. After aborting the landing, why would the pilot start to climb and then dive into the earth? Engineer Jim Foots checked the accuracy of the aircraft's instruments. Perhaps they were lying. Well, we look at the um, instruments, uh, and which leads to looking at the dial faces and in the internal mechanisms of the instruments, because, uh, again, not all FDRs record all parameters. Uh, so we can look at, um, uh, at the instruments and at times get information from the dial face, such as pointer slaps, uh, gear train damage, and they will tell us what that actual system was doing at impact. If the impact was severe enough, the pointer would slap against the dial face and leave a mark. Even if the pointer was lost, the telltale mark would remain. Most of the instruments were destroyed beyond recognition. Only the altimeter survived, and it showed the plane's altitude setting was right where it should have been. The pilot should have known how close to the ground he was. Once again, the solution remained elusive. But Foots had his suspicions. If the plane was going down, a warning system should have alerted the pilot, unless the warning system itself was faulty. He directed his attention to the warning lights. Light bulb filaments can tell a great deal about conditions at the moment a plane crashes. Well, we do uh, light bulb analysis, even if the aircraft does have a, an FDR or CVR. Uh, if the FDR gives us an indication that there was a, uh, a problem, a warning, then we can look at the light bulbs and, uh, and actually say, yeah, this light was on, and that uh, the pilot did have a, a warning or a caution light. A bulb that's lit when it's broken reacts very differently than a bulb that's off. It's easy for the trained eye to spot the difference. What we're looking at here is the filaments. And what we look for with the filaments is a deformation, as you see here, total uncoiling of the filament, which is indicative of a, a hot or illuminated filament when impacted, as opposed to a, 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 a lamp that was off or cold at impact, where we have uh, just a straight brittle fracture. Foots found that none of the 37 surviving warning bulbs from Flight 70 had been on. But that didn't necessarily mean all was well with the craft. Still searching for clues, investigators focused again on the position of the aircraft. While attempting to abort the landing, perhaps the plane's nose tilted too high. At a steep angle, air can't glide easily over the wings. 
the plane stalls and drops from the sky. In order to figure out if Flight 70 stalled, investigators would have to climb into the pilot's seat. Whatever happened to Skylink Flight 70 came without warning. Now, investigators had to reconstruct the tragedy. The stall avoidance system on this type of aircraft was notoriously unforgiving. It provided very little notice to the pilot before a stall. At low altitude, the difference between stall and crash and life and death is mere seconds. To see if the plane's pitch or angle in the air would cause a stall, investigators needed to reconstruct its final moments. For that, they needed a flight simulator. They fed in all the data they collected, along with pilot commands from the voice recorder. The simulator would combine these disconnected clues into a close estimate of the plane's position. We knew what the uh, altitude and airspeed of the aircraft was. Uh, at the start of the missed approach. We also knew uh, when they added the power, when they retracted the landing gear, and when they retracted the flaps. So uh, we were able to come into the simulator and uh, use those parameters that were available off the flight data recorder and uh, fly the airplane in accordance with those parameters and then through that process determine what the pitch attitude of the aircraft was. If the pitch was too steep, the plane would have stalled, then crashed. But that wasn't what happened. The simulator showed the plane's pitch was fine. Stalling and a faulty stall avoidance system were ruled out. After a tireless examination of the plane from nose to tail, investigators could finally rule out mechanical failure. They had only one more place to find answers, with the man in the cockpit. To determine if human error was at fault, Roger Ayotte needed to get inside the pilot's head. Once we had uh, eliminated uh, um, the, the possibility of any of mechanical malfunction of the aircraft, uh, and that was probably a couple of months at, uh, into the investigation, uh, then we were able to focus all of our efforts on the operational and human performance sides uh, of the accident. While one type of investigator searches for physical clues, another looks for psychological ones. Black box expert Mike Poole created a voice print, turning emotion into a picture. And human performance investigators Ron Coleman and Beth McCullough were brought in to study it. To explore what was going on in the minds of the pilots, they scrutinized their final words. Descending. Okay. Descending. So his first response first one's was casual. Is, yes. Uh, OK, no big deal. But the second one's got a lot of anxiety in it. When the co-pilot alerted the pilot they were descending, the pilot answered calmly with a simple OK. McCullough felt there was far more going on than the first playback led them to believe. But if you've got someone next to you who's obviously expressing um, concern and, and, and in a rather agitated voice, then you begin to wonder, and that might be your first question, is this captain being really calm about the situation? Has it fully under control? Or is he unaware of the gravity of the situation? Descending. Okay. Descending. First thing that we picked up was the anxiety in the co-pilot's voice uh, when he uttered the second descending. Um, after that, we went back, listened to the entire tape many, many times to try and determine the various uh, operational issues that might have emerged or did emerge, and also some of the human performance issues that were clear just from listening to the voices and the pauses and the hesitation. From the voice recording, Coleman and McCullough surmised that the pilot sounded unconcerned, oblivious to the fact that he was speeding towards certain death. They ruled out suicide. Psychological profiles were normal. The investigation team suspected the pilot was literally lost in the clouds. He didn't know which way was up. And he wasn't trusting his instruments or his co-pilot to set him straight. Did pilot error cause the crash? The team was close to figuring it out. But before they could, more testing was necessary.
Was the pilot of Flight 70 truly disoriented in the fog? To illustrate what he might have experienced, Mike Poole collated the data and produced an animated version of the fatal flight. Next to it, he created an illusion plane. It was based on what the human performance experts believe the pilot may have perceived. Call missed approach. He asked for the gear to come up. The gear is selected up. He calls for the flaps to come up. And the first officer has responded with flaps coming up to half. Shrouded by fog, unable to see the runway, the pilot searches for visual clues outside his window. In his efforts to get his bearings, he fails to notice his gauges or to heed his co-pilot's concern. What we know and from our operational investigators suspect that he is uh, maybe adjusting the throttles in the cockpit, he's maybe unfamiliar with his flight director, he's in fog, he's perhaps a little bit lost in respect to where exactly is the runway, is it to my right, is it to my left? So all these factors can be distracting him from that task of watching those instruments. The animation showed that the pilot did indeed confuse up with down. The condition is called somatographic illusion. It occurs when pilots are deprived of visual cues. Instead, they rely on gut instinct. Basically, the human body cannot distinguish the difference between a force through your stomach pushing against the back of your chair due to thrust, due to being accelerated down a runway, for example, or the same force due to pitching you up and feeling the, the effects of gravity pushing you back in the chair. Though the pilot may have been operating under an illusion, the consequences of his actions were dreadfully real. Investigators went back to the simulator to experience for themselves Flight 70's fatal illusion. A simulator is an excellent place to perform a test for illusions because it's a machine that's been built to trick the eye and mind. In a simulator, you're in a building and obviously it can't accelerate you down a runway. So, but it wants to make you feel that. So to achieve that, what they do is they tilt you back in your chair and you feel the force of gravity in your chair and then they fool your visual senses by taking the horizon instead of you would normally see it rise, they actually keep it level. So your eyes think the horizon's level, you're feeling this force through your stomach into the back of the chair, that is the sensation of accelerating down the runway and that essentially is the somatographic illusion. Roger Ayotte took the mock fatal flight. All the data were entered and the horizon taken away so he could feel the sensation as the pilot had. But he'd fly under instrument flight rules, or IFR, relying totally on his gauges so he would know where the plane was relative to the ground. Okay, and this is the same approach uh, being conducted uh, in, in IFR conditions. Uh, so you have to concentrate totally on your instruments. And as you can see, the, you have no visual references outside uh, the cockpit. With his view blocked, he couldn't tell if he was going up or down while accelerating. But the gauges told him he was heading toward the ground. The simulated flight proved that the pilot had fallen victim to the illusion. You can fly by the seat of your pants to a certain extent when you're uh, in visual flight conditions, and, and that is done frequently. However, when you're in instrument flight conditions, so when you're flying in fog or cloud or something like that, then um, uh, you don't have uh, those uh, visual senses that you, that you do when you're flying visually. The forces of motion in three dimensions can play tricks on the mind. The inner ear regulates balance and lets us know where we stand, but it needs a visual reference. It's extremely difficult to overpower the human instinct to rely on vision when flying. But through sheer willpower, a pilot can stay true to the instruments until his mind overcomes his body. Unfortunately, the pilot of Flight 70 wasn't aware of the danger. It takes a network of complex systems to keep a plane in the air. It also takes a tangle of circumstances to send one crashing down. In both Rose Lawn, Indiana and Terrace, British Columbia, a combination of factors conspired against the aircraft, dooming the passengers and crew. But aboard the planes were the black boxes. These indestructible witnesses, coupled with human ingenuity, determined what went wrong. 
By surviving a crash, black boxes enable us to prevent countless others. A serial killer is delivering death door to door. Detectives move in to stop him before he kills again. Because I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Bodies begin turning up in Northern California. Investigators search for a common denominator and find a pattern of uncommon cruelty. For years, a deadly predator has taunted police while snaring victim after victim. With every kill, he grows bolder, while authorities grow more desperate to catch him. Serial killers don't stop on their own. As the body count rises, investigators must use all of their resources to put an end to their murder by numbers. Some of the names in this episode have been changed. January 12, 1990 was another beautiful day in San Diego. But Chris Burns wasn't enjoying it. He was growing concerned over the whereabouts of his fiancée. When his roommates came home, Burns asked if they'd seen Tiffany Schultz, who also shared the apartment. No, I haven't seen her all day. Why? Because her car's downstairs. Her car was in the parking lot, but in the several hours that Burns had been home, she hadn't appeared. The other roommates hadn't seen her either. Then they opened the door to a nightmare. What's going on? Oh, my God. Schultz lay dead, partially disrobed and covered in blood. You guys, call the cops, get somebody here, all right? Burns stayed with her while his roommates called police. As detectives interviewed Burns and his roommates, San Diego homicide investigators inspected the crime scene. One of the first things they noticed was that the body was posed with outstretched arms and legs. Bruises indicated that the victim had struggled fiercely for her life. She had been stabbed multiple times in the chest. There was no sign of sexual assault. The answering machine tape was taken to check for suspicious messages. As the technicians continued working, Chris Burns told detectives his story. I put my hands up under her head like this. They noticed his hands and pants were marked with blood. The situation gave Sergeant Ed Petrick of the San Diego Police Homicide Unit grave doubts about Burns. It seemed very odd to anybody that it would be a fellow that comes home, house is open, his girlfriend's nowhere, nowhere around, but her keys are there, her car's there, her purse is there, but she's nowhere around. And there's a roommate's door to the bedroom that's closed, which is usually never closed, and he never bothers to to knock or open it. Burns was taken to the police station for further questioning about his fiancée's murder. Sam. He admitted that he and Schultz were having problems. Let me tell you why I brought you in here. The grisly slaying came at a time when they were supposedly trying to salvage their relationship. Lately, they couldn't get along. Now, Schultz was dead and Burns looked like the main suspect. The blood on his clothes told police all they needed to know. But Burns claimed that the stain on his shirt came from touching Schultz after he discovered her dead. He believed the blood on his pants was his own from a recent accident on the construction site where he worked. The story seemed too contrived. 
Chris Burns was arrested and charged with the murder of Tiffany Schultz. I can do that. It's not quite that. Schultz's autopsy revealed she was stabbed nearly 60 times. While researching this brutal homicide case, police learned that the victim was paying her way through college by dancing at a nightclub. The manager confirmed that Schultz's relationship with Burns was tumultuous. She told police that he didn't want her working there. They often came to blows over it. Their last incident had been recent. Transcripts from the answering machine tape contained an apology from Burns for the hard time he gave his fiancée about her job. But police wondered if he'd lost his temper and his control one last time. Only careful forensic analysis of the evidence could determine if Schultz was the victim of Burns's rage. Burns's shirt and pants were sent to the lab to determine whose blood was on them. To better see the blood stains, the genes were turned inside out. When the results were positive, ABO blood typing was performed. The blood on the shirt matched Schultz's AB blood type. But I'm sure we should. But the blood on the pants was type O, Burns' own type. Serologist Larry Turner of the Jackson Police Department Crime Lab performed the analysis. Based on what I found, I was able to determine that the story that Chris Burns had been telling, uh, it was possible that it was true. Uh, the blood on his clothing matched him and not that of uh, Tiffany Schultz. And on his t-shirt where he said he had been down to touch her and possibly gotten some of her blood on the t-shirt, that was correct as well. Burns' story, as odd as it seemed, might be true. Police had no other evidence with which to hold him. He was released, though still considered the prime suspect. But police would soon regret releasing him. On February 16, 1990, one month after Tiffany Schultz was found murdered, police got another call to the same apartment complex. Take a deep breath another victim had been found, a bit. brutally hey, okay. murdered. Hey, what do you have? We got this one in the kitchen. The partially nude body of Janine Weinhold, a student at San Diego State University, was discovered by her roommate. She had been stabbed several times. As in the Schultz case, the killer also posed this body with the legs outstretched. Police feared they were dealing with a serial killer. Uh, there just wasn't any question in, in our minds that it had to be the same suspect. I mean, just the body position, uh, the stab wound clusters in the chest uh, just just looked like the same murder basically different room this murder occurred only about 100 yards from the apartment where the first victim was killed blood-stained clothes were found on the floor by the bed the killer left the murder weapon a carving knife in the sink but he left something else even more important. Seminal fluid was found on the bedspread. It provided evidence that the victim had been raped. It also provided police with their best hope for learning the killer's identity. In the lab, Larry Turner tested the evidence. In the early 90s, DNA testing was beyond the scope of most labs. Turner would have to rely on the older and less precise blood typing tests. He found that all of the blood and bodily fluids tested positive for type O. The blood evidence cast further suspicion on Chris Burns, the primary suspect, who had type O blood. Take some of the material. To be certain, Larry Turner analyzed the genetic markers within Burns' blood and in the fluid samples found at the murder scene. Genetic markers are inherited proteins that vary from individual to individual. 
While people may share some of the same ones, certain markers are more rare and can be used to make an ID. Genetic marker tests are dependable, but not nearly as precise as DNA. Turner found that the genetic markers of the suspect, Chris Burns, didn't match those taken from the second murder scene. That left investigators with two murders and no suspect. They returned to the apartment complex and interviewed female residents to see if they'd seen anyone suspicious. Police feared that these two victims were just the beginning. 3400 Claremont Drive, that's Detectives right. Detectives created a list of over 1,000 suspects from the leads they gathered from the victim's friends and acquaintances. About a block away, there's a couple of burglaries. With two murders unsolved, the police were casting a wide net, trying to find their man before he killed again. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. On April 3rd, 1990, two months after the Weinhold murder, police received an urgent call. A woman had been found brutally stabbed. This is a house and apartment, sir. Sir, you need to calm down for me if you can. Okay, where is the suspect at in this? A witness saw a man with a knife fleeing the scene, his face covered by a T-shirt. Can you tell me, did he have the knife with him? Police rushed to respond. They met Tammy Ho, who returned from the apartment swimming pool and found her friend, Holly Tarr, mortally wounded with a single stab through the heart. Holly Tarr's murder occurred in the same apartment building where the second victim, Janine Weinhold, was killed. Outside, police discovered the knife and the T-shirt held by the killer as he fled the scene. They also found a shoe print left in the mud, which they thought belonged to the suspect. Unfortunately, eyewitnesses couldn't identify him. The girlfriend, uh, Tammy, she basically couldn't give any description at all. Just, it was a male, you know, saw, saw a flash go by. She, she couldn't help in that area. We had a second witness who, uh, at least pin down the race of the suspect uh, as being uh, a black male. The knife and t-shirt were clean of fingerprints or hair samples. After three murders, all investigators knew for sure was that the victims were all white females between the ages of 18 and 21, left semi-nude, posed with their legs outstretched and stabbed in the heart. All they knew about the killer was that he might be an African-American. Because the slayings took place in the area of San Diego known as Claremont, the murderer was dubbed the Claremont Killer. A deadly predator, a serial killer, was on the loose. Police looked at their list of more than 1,000 suspects and, from those, re-interviewed all of their African-American suspects again. Hundreds of blood and saliva samples were voluntarily obtained. While the samples were being tested, the killing continued. On May 22, 1990, another woman was murdered in her apartment in mid-city San Diego. The pattern of stab wounds was similar to the previous three murders. The Claremont killer was on the move. Four months later, 43-year-old Pamela Clark and her 18-year-old daughter Amber were found murdered in their San Diego home. Both partially nude bodies bore stab wounds around the heart and were posed like the previous victims. There was no question after the double murder of the Clarks that things really, really got heated up. We had politicians show up at the mobile command post. Um, I had detectives hadn't had a day off in 40 days, uh, which was no problem, you know, they, they just, we had to catch this, this guy. But we were back to square one. 
police had a terrifying killer on the loose with few clues and no idea of where he might strike next. Time was against them. Each day he ran free, and more women were in danger. The Claremont killer laid low for five months, leaving San Diego investigators with nothing to go on. The trail heated up again on February 3rd, 1991, more than a year after he had made his first kill. Linda Parker, age 23, was about to take a shower when she heard noises at her front door. As he left. Parker's neighbor noted the make and model of the man's car. Meanwhile, Parker called police, reporting a possible encounter with the Claremont killer. Parker suspected the man at her door had stalked her from a nearby gym. A previous victim, Pamela Clark, had worked out at the same gym right before her murder. Perhaps this was the killer's current spot for scouting victims. Officers distributed flyers and asked people at the gym if they had seen the man or the vehicle that Parker described. The next day, they received a call. Someone had spotted the man on the flyers sitting in his car outside the gym. Police apprehended the suspect. His name was Cleophus Prince. Police had interviewed him months earlier. He had declined to provide a blood sample. Police needed a sample if they hoped to compare Prince's DNA to crime scene evidence. To win his consent, they didn't let on that he was a murder suspect. Keep it up on the table, they told please. him he was arrested for the attempted burglary of Linda Parker's home the prior day. Oh. Did you know these Investigators cards? checked his credit cards. Fact, Each had the marks of having been used to slip cards. door locks. Prince sure cooperated and provided a blood sample without detectives having to resort to a warrant. Hey, it can happen. Until the DNA yeah, results sure came back, right police didn't have enough evidence to hold him. Yes, Prince was released, but he was kept under close surveillance. The blood sample was rushed to testing. If successful, the DNA would provide more solid evidence than genetic markers would. The problem was that in the early 90s, the technology was new and it could take a year before the results came back. With nothing to hold the suspect, he would be free to kill again. With time running against them, investigators relied on a less comprehensive but faster test that would compare similarities between the sample and the crime scene DNA. If similarities existed, investigators could assume they were on the right track. If the DNA bore no superficial resemblance, they had the wrong man. Within a month, the results came back. The test indicated a match. We just were, I mean, almost in tears. It was just unbelievable emotion involved in, in working with something and dealing with the families and, and all those crime scenes, and, and it was over. Prince was located and arrested. Oh, wow. Police were now able to gather more evidence and buy more time to run complete DNA tests. In Prince's possession were two rings that belonged to one of the victims. Police also found shoes with soles that matched the print left at a murder scene. Hey, what's going on, bud? Though police would never know what triggered his homicidal rage, they had a good idea of how his crimes evolved. 
Having perfected his craft as a burglar, he expanded his repertoire to include assault, rape, and murder. He tracked his victims from the gym and the pool, knowing that soon after they entered their apartments, they would be vulnerable while taking a shower. Prince would then break into their apartments and assault and stab them. Based on evidence gathered at the scenes, Prince was convicted of six murders. He awaits execution at San Quentin. Cleopas Prince actively sought his victims. Other serial killers wait for their prey to come to them. On May 3, 1983, in San Francisco, two 55-gallon barrels were found in Golden Gate Park. Police had been called to the scene by two hikers who reported a foul odor coming from the barrels. Police suspected they might contain human remains. They were wrapped in plastic, their lids sealed with cement, but one was leaking. They were taken to police headquarters where they were x-rayed before they were opened so as not to disturb any evidence inside. The x-rays were sent to Dr. Boyd Stevens, chief medical examiner for the city and county of San Francisco. One of the barrels had two bodies in it, and that was evident by two complete skeletons, including skulls and spinal columns, etc. Uh, one of the barrels had one body in it. Um, we couldn't tell the sex at that time, but we could see that there were dental fillings, uh, metal material consistent with uh, bullet uh, fragments or jackets as well as identifying personal items like rings or earrings and so forth. Now that they knew human remains were inside the barrels, investigators had to determine how they got there. Technicians took their time looking for any clues the killer might have left. Kenneth Moses, an inspector at the San Francisco Crime Lab, began by examining the exterior of the barrels. He hoped he could find some sort of print on the packaging or the tape. I but getting clean fingerprints off tape can be tricky. More oil. Powder won't work because it sticks to everything. And most fingerprint chemicals dissolve the adhesive, destroying the print. Moses tried an experiment. By combining a dark blue dye, an antibiotic, and water, he concocted a dye called crystal violet. He hoped that when the tape was dipped into the solution, the antibiotic would stick to the protein left on a fingerprint, staining it purple. After 14 hours of labor, slowly processing each strip of tape as it came off, we finally got down around 15 or 20 layers of tape to the last layer. Now, no prints were on any of those hundreds of yards of tape. Finally, we peel off the last piece of tape, put it into the crystal violet, and poof, up comes his beautiful fingerprint. A simple magnifying glass revealed another crucial discovery. Presumably, the killer left a clear fingerprint behind in the fresh cement as he sealed one of the barrels. A synthetic polymer was mixed and carefully spread over the print. When it dried, it formed a near-perfect cast, which was then used to make a record of the print on paper. After four days of gathering all they could from the barrel's exteriors, investigators were ready to open them. One yielded the bodies of two nude females who'd been tied together. The women were later identified through their fingerprints as Glenda Wheatley and Paula Rodriguez, two prostitutes. Rodriguez worked for Thomas Michaels, identified as the clothed male victim in the other barrel. 
Each had been shot in the head. The victims had been ID'd, but the identity of their killer remained a mystery. Police spoke with friends of the victims, but none could shed any light on who could have done this. Investigators also ran the prints, but came up with no matches. Three months after the barrels were found, a man driving on a rural road in California's San Mateo County, just outside of San Francisco, made a similarly gruesome discovery. He immediately summoned police. He led them to a bound female body with what looked like a bullet wound to the head. A grim trail of shredded clothing punctuated the horrific scene. Detective Sergeant Robert well, Morse deduced what it meant. I need for you to go down to the... She had uh, nylon rope extending from uh, both of her ankles, and it appeared as though she had been uh, drugged down the road. Um, and we later measured off the distance, and she had indeed been dragged for 1.9 miles. The entire area was secured, and each bit of evidence carefully noted. A garbage bag was found near the probable starting point of the brutal dragging. The first task after collecting all of the evidence was to identify the victim. Detectives ran a check on her fingerprints. She was identified as Marsha Geary, a prostitute from Oakland, California. Now, police knew her name. The next question was, how did she die? The autopsy revealed that she had been uh, shot in the back of the head the trajectory going downward approximately 45 degrees. The entrance wound uh, was an oblong shape, which is a little bit unusual. The nylon coated 38 caliber bullet recovered from the victim was also unusual. It had none of the lands and grooves that a gun barrel usually etches on a slug as it passes through. Police were baffled by what kind of weapon could have fired the fatal shot. The garbage bag from the crime scene was closely examined for fingerprints and other trace evidence. The bag was tested with cyanoacrylate, or superglue. When heated, the chemical's fumes attached to the prints, making them visible. A latent footprint was discovered that was much too large to belong to the victim. All investigators needed was a suspect to compare the footprint to. Well, thank you so much, sir. Appreciate that. Police questioned Marcia Geary's friends and family to learn where she'd been and whom she'd met recently. Her father said the last time he saw her, she'd asked him for money. She told him she was trying to find a job and asked him if he would help her get a car. Please, I Police I'll also learned from her friends that she was planning to spend please, the weekend with a man. Now, Thank you. Thank you. For now, his identity go. remained a mystery. Okay. The day after Marcia Geary was found, the body of Catherine Barrett was discovered in a San Francisco cul-de-sac. She'd been tortured and stabbed to death. Her body was wrapped in plastic. Metal shavings were retrieved from the wrapping. As police investigated this latest murder, they got a tip from a man named Raleigh Hill, the owner of Marsha Geary's apartment. Hill told police that Geary was planning to see a man named Jack for the weekend. Hill didn't know Jack's last name, but he knew he lived in a warehouse. What'd she tell you about Jack? 
just that she was going to see him. Bill said that on two occasions, he dropped Geary off there for dates. Hill gave police the address. It was 20 yeah. miles from where Geary's body was found. Where Jack lives in. Yeah, I could okay. Get there and where it is. All right, take your team members. The warehouse served as the offices of Anthony Electric, an electrical contracting business owned by a former police officer named Anthony John Sully. Mm -hmm. We've explained that to you already. So here's how you Better known as Jack. Okay, do you have any other questions about it? No. Okay. Investigators also learned that friends of Catherine Barrett, the most recent victim, told them the day before her body was found that she was going to Anthony Electric. The news sparked their interest. The information gave them enough for a search warrant for the warehouse. They were about to learn the shocking truth about Jack Sully. A homicide investigation led to an electrical contractor's warehouse, where two murdered prostitutes were last reported to have been going. Fort George Williams, Sam, four five one. A costumed woman wearing a tutu met police at the door. She led them to a small apartment in the rear of the warehouse. Among the litter of drug paraphernalia, police confronted a disoriented, partially clad Jack Sully. As they explored the room, the bizarre scene became grotesque. While walking into this apartment, uh, one gets the sense that uh, it's almost like a torture chamber. He had a hook up on the ceiling. He had uh, various ropes around. Uh, he had uh, VCR tapes of pornography and sadism. And one would uh, just get the feeling that it was uh, a horrible place. In a preliminary search of the apartment and surrounding warehouse, police found several important pieces of evidence, including a pistol with the barrel removed. It contained nylon-covered bullets, just like the one that killed Marsha Geary. A gun without a barrel might explain the odd oblong shape of the victim's wound, since a bullet shot from it would tend to be unstable and tumble instead of going straight. Jack Sully was arrested and charged with the murder of Marsha Geary. The warehouse was now a crime scene and subject to a full-blown forensics investigation. We photographed virtually every inch of it. We covered every inch of it. And uh, we're happy that we did because we, we gained a lot of evidence out of it. Among their finds were metal shavings and nylon rope, like those found at the crime scenes. Investigators also found blood, lots of it. The warehouse seemed to be a grim chamber of horrors, an inner sanctum for unspeakable acts of torture and cruelty. With Jack Sully behind bars, police began to ask his acquaintances what they knew about him. They learned he'd bragged about killing three people, putting them in barrels, and dumping them in Golden Gate Park. Now that a suspect was finally in custody, investigators could compare his prints against the ones taken from the barrels of the unsolved triple murder. As soon as he received samples of Sully's prints, Kenneth Moses knew the results. I took a look at the prints, and believe me, I knew those prints by heart. The minute I saw Sully's prints, I knew this was the guy. Sully was charged with the murders of the victims found in Golden Gate Park. Police also obtained his footprints. They compared them to the print lifted from the garbage bag found where Marsha Geary's body had been dragged. 
the prints matched. In the end, an insurmountable stack of forensics evidence was brought against Jack Sully. Metal shavings found in his warehouse matched shavings found on his second victim's body. The plastic sheeting found around the body of the man sealed in one of the 55-gallon barrels matched sheeting found in Jack Sully's truck. From the investigation, Sully's pattern of violence became clear. Under the influence of free-based cocaine, he would pick up prostitutes. When they arrived at his warehouse, he would subject them to prolonged periods of bondage, beatings, and sexual abuse. And ultimately, he murdered them. Forensics linked him to five victims, but other evidence proved he had killed six. On June 3, 1986, Anthony John Sully was convicted of six counts of murder and sentenced to death in California. Serial killers follow no apparent rules except one, to blend in with everyone else. On June 28, 1989, in Riverside, California, two construction workers stopped on the side of the road to eat their lunch. But then they noticed the body of a woman lying at the bottom of an embankment. Officers and forensic technicians from Riverside County Sheriff's Office responded to their call. The victim was dressed in shorts and a man's Western-style shirt. A towel covered her body. She had no identification. The autopsy revealed the woman was strangled to death. A search of the fingerprints file identified her as Tara Biggs, a 28-year-old prostitute. Evidence collected from the crime scene was sent to the California Department of Justice Crime Lab. Investigators found little more than a few assorted fibers. Whoever killed this woman didn't leave much evidence behind. On December 13, 1989, in Riverside, California, another female victim, Pamela Martin, was discovered on a rural road. She appeared to have been killed elsewhere, redressed, and abandoned there. Like the woman found six months earlier, she too was a prostitute. There were other similarities. Police found fibers similar to those found on the first victim. They also found tire tracks. Photographs were taken for examination in the lab. The photographs were blown up to actual size. The tread pattern and wear marks would be unique to the killer's vehicle. Criminalists identified two different brands of tires. They determined the killer probably drove a truck or a van with an alignment problem, causing the front tires to wear more quickly than the rear. The similarities between the crime scenes linked the two murders to a single killer. And he wasn't finished yet. In the 16 months following the discovery of the first victim, six more prostitutes were found murdered in and around Riverside. The information on the tires proved invaluable according to Steve Sikofsky of the California Department of Justice Crime Lab. As subsequent victims were found, we were armed with the information of what kind of tire track we would be looking for, and that would be one of the first things we could see whether or not, in fact, this is another one of the series that was developing. When area police departments met to compare forensic evidence, they realized that along with the tire tracks, the hair and fiber evidence was consistent. Gray and red fibers, gold threads, and bits of rope were found on most of the bodies. These fibers lifted from the victims literally tied the murders together. We were able to determine that, in fact, it looked like we had 
the same suspect environment from one victim to the next. And really what that meant to the investigation was it looked like we did in fact have a serial killer. With each new murder, the killer grew bolder and more sadistic. Police found the body of another prostitute, Laura Mills, in a grove of trees, stabbed and strangled. A peeled and partially eaten grapefruit lay nearby. This odd detail gave police an idea of the kind of monster they were dealing with, according to senior investigator Bob Creed. To where he could just have murdered this person, strangled this person, stabbed this person, and then stood over her and ate a grapefruit. Uh, we, we felt that this told us something about uh, the emotional makeup of this person that we were looking for. Police seemed no closer to finding him. By 1991, 10 prostitutes had been murdered and several had been redressed and left in rural areas. The only clues to the killer's identity were the fibers, hairs, and tire tracks that he left behind. But without suspects, this evidence amounted to nothing. Since the victims were prostitutes and drug users, police questioned women working the red light districts of Riverside and Elsinore. Men known to frequent these areas were investigated as potential suspects. One woman provided a description of a man who had roughed her up. A sketch was made from her description. It was distributed, but no lead surfaced. Investigators hoped to have better luck focusing on the killer's vehicle. The tires left their unique prints on each murder scene, and the interior may have provided the fibers found on the victims. If investigators could find his vehicle, they could find the killer. So we let the investigators know to look for a vehicle with certain type tires on it. Let them know that they might be looking for a vehicle that had gray interior carpet. They might find some rope fibers. They might also find some other things in the van that had gold fibers in it because we found a, a prevalence of gold type fibers. Maybe some blanket, a sleeping bag along that line because of the type fibers that we found on many of the victims. At an earlier murder scene, police found the tread prints of a popular tennis shoe near the victim. As the spree of murders continued, forensic technicians began to see the same prints. As the tennis shoe's print continued turning up, the tread showed increasing wear. Likewise, the tire tracks found at the scenes were changing as individual tires wore unevenly and had to be replaced. In January 1991, detectives from several area agencies met to create a task force. In July, with no end in sight, a behavioral scientist was brought in to study the crimes and create a profile of the killer. Since serial killers rarely kill outside of their race, the profile described a white male between the ages of 35 and 40. The police profile and other news of the serial killings filled the newspapers. It appeared that the suspect himself was following the report, as the next victim was Tracy O'Donnell, who'd been stabbed, strangled, posed, and mutilated. Though she shared these similarities with most of the other victims, one thing made her unique. She was African-American. That he read in the paper that the serial killer stays within their own race, and yet he went out and found this black prostitute and killed her. It seemed like he did that just to show us that we were wrong and that perhaps maybe he selects his victims, uh, that he's in control here. The murderer was maintaining his anonymity, and he was becoming more defiant. By the end of 1991, his victims were being found at the terrifying rate of one per month. 19 dead female prostitutes had been discovered, and there would undoubtedly be more. 
investigators in Riverside, California, on the trail of a brutal serial killer, finally got a break on January 9th, 1992. An officer patrolling the red light district of Elsinore saw a man speaking to a prostitute from his van. The man drove off, making a right turn without signaling. The officer pulled the van over. The driver's name was William Suff. The officer thought his van fit the description of the vehicle of the suspected serial killer. He noticed the tires were mismatched, and each showed a different wear pattern. William Suff was placed under arrest. His van was impounded at the police station and given a thorough inspection. Police found a gold pillow and a sleeping bag. A blood-stained knife was wedged ominously between the driver's seat and the console. Investigators also found a length of rope consistent with rope fibers found on the victims. While the knife and other evidence from the van went to the lab, investigators obtained a warrant to search Suff's home. There, they found a worn pair of sneakers that matched prints found near several of the earlier victims. Officers also found Western-style shirts, like the one that had been found on the first victim, a stack of vehicle maintenance receipts. Back at the lab, DNA tests were performed on the knife found in Suff's van. The results matched the blood of the last victim. William Suff's blood, saliva, and other bodily fluids were tested to establish his DNA profile for comparison to fluid evidence found on some of the victims. In many cases, it was a match. Fiber from the gold pillow and sleeping bag, along with samples of Suff's hair, also matched evidence found at the crime scenes. Tire marks from Suff's van were consistent with imprints photographed at several locations. The vehicle maintenance records were also helpful in establishing when Suff had his tires rotated or changed. Police kept their own records of the tire positions at each crime scene. When they compared Suff's records with their own notes, they found an exact match. Police were able to surmise William Suff's homicidal pattern. He would cruise the red light districts. When he chose a prostitute, he would invite her into his van and drive to a secluded place. He subdued his victims, tying them so he could torture and rape. Then he killed them, either by stabbing or strangulation. Occasionally, he dressed the victims in articles of his own clothing so he could move them without getting blood in his van. He made no effort to hide the remains. On July 19, 1995, William Suff was convicted of multiple murders. He was sentenced to death 12 times. A serial killer's compulsion for murder never stops. Once he finds a pattern that works, 
he'll stick with it time and again. But the pattern that provides his success also establishes a trail for those who are sworn to track him down. <laughs>